Until everybody uh, is seated, let me announce um, to you a small change in the program due to the great pressure of time under which we find ourselves. After the two keynotes we will hear in a moment, there will not be a discussion. Instead, we will immediately start with our panel. And uh, it's only after six o'clock when we come to the final discussion that we will have an opportunity to discuss all the things we have heard throughout the day. So remember your question, make a note of them, and ask them for the final discussion after six o'clock. That would be lovely. Thank you. Now, this morning we have heard a great deal about the Washington principles and the impact they had for institutional cons considerations and, and what plans there are for the future as a result. Now, Benedict Savoy is going to extend our eyes, as it were, and look at something which has a lot to do with our problem, the awareness, the sensitivity vis-a-vis -vis art in different political dimensions should also be addressed. And what is meant by this is that the unmentionable crimes committed by the National Socialists have led to measures taken um, during the Second World War and afterwards when uh, the decision was made to compensate private citizens, unheard of until then. And as a result of the measures taken since World War II, a political set of measures can be derived which also affect the post-colonial time. And that is exactly what Benedict Savoy is going to talk about. Uh, she will talk about provenance research in different collections and will ask the question as to whether the research of uh, persecution-related uh, museum collections should be put on an equal footing with those collections that came into being during colonialism. She asked about provenance and asked whether it might not be a good idea to have a similar conference of the old colonial powers and governments so that a comparable final declaration like that of the 1998 Washington Declaration might be arrived at. Now, Benedict Savoy is probably not somebody I need to introduce, but um, for the sake of completeness, I will do so anyway. She studied at the Etoile Normale Supérieure in Paris and uh, obtained a PhD about Napoleon's looted art from Germany. She's then been uh, teaching at uh, Berlin's um, University of Fine Arts, and from 2009 she's been a professor for modern history of arts. She is a member of a variety of different boards and advisory councils. In 2016, she received the Leibniz Award of the German research community. In the very same year, she was uh, nominated professor at the Collège de France in Paris. She's a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and of the German Academy for language and poetry. Her research is theft of art in a global context, transnational museum history, the art market, provenance, and artistic mobility. Well, we can look forward to a very exciting presentation. Uh, many thanks for these kind words of welcome. Dear Mr. Lupfer, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, and also dear students, because there are students here as well. I would like to thank you very much indeed for inviting me to be here. Before I start, let me also tell you that I am not going to talk about this subject uh, that was printed in the flyer for a variety of reasons. And the reason that you will understand is that uh, recent developments uh, culminated in Emmanuel Macron's announcement that 26 cultural objects are to be intended to be returned to Benin, which he announced on Friday evening. And that has accelerated something which has certainly made me race and uh, caused a lot of turmoil for me. But anyway, I, I 
wasn't quite able to talk about these things. So it, I'll take a few hours to really digest it all. Um, I'm really looking forward to that. Now I'm going to talk about the history of collections. Um, and the title of my presentation now is Who is or was afraid of the history of collections? And I've structured this presentation in two, as I call it, drawers. The first drawer is Washington minus four. The second, discretion since 1800. And the third is free research and museums. On the first point, Washington minus four. It is the year 1994. At that time, as you may remember, uh, there was actually a file I opened in Bonn, and even though I didn't read it through to the end, I would like to address these matters here today. It might uh, give us a few ideas. So in 1994 in Mulhouse, uh, Mulhausen, in uh, at that time, Helmut Kohl was the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, which had just been reunited, and he returned 28 paintings to François Mitterrand. And these were paintings which had been taken by a Wehrmacht officer and handed over to a soldier during the Second World War. The paintings then ended up in Germany, and for all the time of the GDR, they were in the National Gallery of East Berlin of the former GDR and, uh, well, were there, were kept there. And it was only after German unification that Helmut Kohl suddenly had the idea, I mean, it wasn't just his idea, mind you, there was a lot of pressure being brought on him, a lot of news media. If you look at the central archives of Berlin State Museums, you will find uh, what has been said. Petra Winter is in charge of the archive, by the way. But um, as a result of all this to do, the 28 main paintings were restituted. And Francois Mitterrand gave a speech, which is so weird that I'm, I'm still curious about it today. And I'd like to present it again. I mean, this actually is the photograph of the official handover of one of the paintings in question. This is um, the Auto Museum. In, in, um, but you can actually see one of the old uh, vehicles behind him. And there you see Helmut Kohl and Francois Mitterrand already ravaged by um, his illness, and they're having um, a glass to toast the handover of this uh, Monet painting, La Route de Valenciennes, the streets of Valenciennes, which uh, was sort of one standing for all the other 27. And the speech given by François Mitterrand at the time um, is uh, recorded. Two of the uh, sections I would like to read out. Uh, your interpreter begs to say that obviously we did not have any idea of this. So it is the uh, address given by François Mitterrand on the occasion of the return to France of a collection of paintings, including paintings by Claude Monet. This uh, restitution was very much in the spirit of Franco-German friendship, and as was later um, declared these paintings were partly originally Jewish owned, others were the result of forced uh, sales done by French collaborators, it is assumed. But in this particular case, it is less the complex history of the 28 paintings that I find interesting. I would like to concentrate on François Mitterrand's speech, which he gave four years before the Washington Conference. Uh, Mr. Chancellor Mitterrand said, and then he says uh, how grateful he is for this return, but also says that he finds this return strange, this restitution of paintings. And that was the reading of the original French text uh, where he described the gesture of return extraordinary. And that is very clear. What is marked in red has been translated here by Mier. So I read it in the German translation. So far, all the museums in Europe, I do not want to talk about other parts of the world that would be generalizing, all the museums in Europe are filled with goods that were conquered or looted in a way that we should not remember. 
So this was on the occasion of uh, restitution of paintings which the NS regime had stolen during the occupation of Paris. And he wasn't going to talk about the fact that uh, these paintings could well have been um, Jewish property originally. He doesn't mention that anywhere in his speech, nor is it mentioned in the press recording about it. It's all very much in, in the spirit of Franco-German friendship. He continues with his speech, and after his uh, expression of gratitude, he moves over to another um, statement, sentence, and he says, I have just expressed my thanks. However, tonight I should also think of the many museums and curators in our countries, many of which are probably dreadfully worried tonight, because after all, what would happen if restitution were to become more widespread? It's not a great risk for me to say, but I assume that your example, dear Helmut Kohl, uh, is and will remain absolutely unique, and that this uh, contagion is definitely not going to spread. And uh, the speaker will now read out the French original. So we notice four years before the Washington conference, which constituted major progress, or rather the beginning of major progress in this whole matter, as far as governments were concerned, the ground had not been prepared for museum transparency. And that brings me to the second part, and I've tried to cut it and streamline my presentation. Because in 1994 and 50 years before and 100 years before that, museums have always been very discreet institutions. We have found a lot of interesting sources telling us how provenance was handled even as early as the 19th century, and because you kindly reminded me that I uh, concentrated very much on Napoleon looting up from Germany, I would like to give you an example from that time, around 1800, when the Musée Napoléon um, stole works of art from all over Europe, from princes, from churches, from uh, private um, aristocratic collections, uh, public museums, everything. At that time, in 1810, when the Musée Napoléon, the Napoleon Museum, as it was called, completely filled up, it was the high point of his uh, achievements, Henri Bell, as he was then called, um, uh, the writer hadn't yet assumed his uh, pseudonym Stendhal, and the finance minister has asked him, together with the director of the Musée Napoléon, who was a friend of Goethe, Napoleon's sort of artistic eye, and uh, he had helped to select paintings in, in Braunschweig, Schwerin, Potsdam, Berlin, everywhere. And so these two people together were to set up something which today we would call an Excel sheet. As Inventaire Napoleon that would enter the pages of history. This was supposed to standardize how to make an inventory of all this huge amount of stolen art. There have been inventories in the history of museums before. Well, basically, as, as soon as people start a collection, they also start an inventory about this collection. But the inventories were specialized. But what happens in uh, uh, 1810 was completely new. Namely, this inventory was actually printed. So there are printed columns. In other words, you mustn't write too much into the margins, right or left. And this column here, uh, description of the sujet was a very narrow comment because it was very important for the Ministry of Finance and its uh, representative, in this case the writer Stendhal, that uh, art historians like Dominique de Vendemont would not write too much about the actual artwork. So Stendhal said they should not talk about the picturesque beauty, they should uh, keep the administrative beauty of a museum, la beauté administrative. That's what this early form of the database was all about. The interesting feature is this origin, that's origin, or provenance. And there's a very intensive exchange of letters between La Rue, Stendhal, and Dunant about how to name this column. It was supposed to be named provenance, 
then it was origin. But very clearly, the idea was not to write this Correggio, for example, is from Italy, but what was to be written in was the previous owner of this Correggio, i.e. this Correggio used to belong to Frederick the Great. And right next to origin, provenance, there are two other columns, which until then had not been part of any museum inventory. That's price, estimated price of this work of art and um, estimated price of the frame. So we noticed that back then around 1800, with this amazing uh, endeavor where they tried to unite all the artworks of, of Europe in the center, France, the country of liberty where art as the product of liberty was to be brought home, quote unquote, into the land of liberty. So at that time, it was very important for the people to know how much money in real terms, capital, this symbolic artistic capital actually meant. And they wanted to know where the artworks came from, in other words, from which collections, because that would also increase the monetary value. Something came in from the Vatican collections, the Apollo Belvedere, Le Lacon group, uh, Raphael's transformation had such a proud provenance that their estimated price went sky high. And these actually were estimated at 1,500,000 francs at the time. That was an unimaginable sum. Nobody uh, had ever paid that for, for any work of art. That would have been sort of 20 city villas or 27 palaces, city palaces in Paris was the approximation of that price. So let's very briefly look at this um, column origin. I have a Correggio, which I've taken as an example. And you can see here origin, you know, the uh, rest on the uh, escape to Egypt and it's appraised as 300,000 French francs. So we move on, so you have an idea. The next one is the famous uh, Saint um, Hieronymus um, Correggio. Here was the uh, uh, appraisal value is given as one million, almost like the Raphael's transformation. Now this inventory sheet uh, was actually um, kept in the um, archives of the Louvre Museum. It's now in the National Museum. And this archive tells us a lot. It tells us a story of taste, a preference, a story of origin. But above all, it tells us a story where provenance is carefully not made transparent. So discretion is granted, even though people are fully aware of the provenance. And we notice that because uh, looking at the many, many volumes uh, which you find in the director's office, there all this knowledge was stored, but for the visitors, there was no, no hint even about the provenance of the objects exhibited in the museum. Some people complained about that. I have a German contemporary, Johann Ludwig Völkel, who was a curator for ancient um, art in Kassel, and he wrote when uh, some places were returned, he said some unknown or not sufficiently appreciated uh, cultural objects uh, went to Paris before the 1815 restitution and um, suddenly uh, became deservedly uh, famous, even though the place where it came from was usually kept quiet or not named correctly. So discretion, ever since 1800, that is exactly what Francois Mitterrand still said in 1994, is basically what he meant. He said, look, dear Mr. Cole, let's not talk about where these objects really came from. We both know what it's about and when they came here or there. We know that virtually all the museums in Europe have brought together their collections under historical conditions that we better not even mention. So you can see over centuries, museums were places of the non-transparency of provenance for a variety of good reasons, certainly. Since the Washington Conference, obviously, this has completely changed, and that's a good thing, too. And this brings me quite quickly to my third and last point, which is very much a plea to continue what has been going on for 20 years, namely cooperation between museums, and university, free cooperation within the framework of joint research projects. And here let me remind you that we 
the old people, the ones who were already adults when the Washington conference was held, those who were at least 20 years old, I mean by that, we now have to hand over to a young generation of provenance researchers, some of which um, are here. I've uh, got a, um, a little portrait gallery of some of these researchers. They stand for all the many young professors, junior professors, and provenance researchers in museums who are working uh, with each other, uncomplicated. They're not at government level, let's call them Mitterrand, but they're using Excel sheets and databases for doing their work. And it is this young generation, probably only 10 years old when Kohl and Mitterrand talked uh, not about museums, or at least Mitterrand tried to avoid talking about museums. That is now the young generation which has got its, hel its hands on the helm. And uh, the young men and women who have this task, I wish you all the best success and a lack of fear. Thank you. Well, to come back to the young people again, it is really quite astounding that the further we get away from the original crime, the more intense our critical examination of this is. It takes the generation afterwards that weren't directly involved, and it takes this distance to work your way into these issues and to get a certain moral perspective on these historical events in which one wasn't directly involved. An example of how this can be dealt in Germany, we will now hear from Dr. Magnus Brechtken, the Deputy Director of the History of Contemporary History, the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich and Berlin. He studied history, political science and philosophy, he wrote his PhD in 1994 in Bonn, and got his professorship qualifications in 2002 at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. From 2002 to 2012, he taught German history and politics at the University of Nottingham in the UK. Among his priority research areas are the history of the Nazi regime, anti-Semitism, critically processing the past, unlike the coming to terms with history term that was used in the 70s and 80s and international relations. He has published many things, including Madagascar for the Jews, Anti-Semitic Ideas and Political Practice, 1885 to 1945, the National Socialist Regime, 1933 to 1937, Life Writing and Political Memoir, and a biography of Albert Speer, a German courier. In his talk, Professor Brentgen, Brechtgen rather, is going to give us an overview about the development and discussion of coming to terms or critically examining the German past after 1945. And it's interesting that we're not saying coming to terms with the past so much as critically examining the past. This will be focusing on the role of artworks confiscated by the Nazis until the Washington conference. And he'll be looking particularly at the last five years. We look forward to your remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, I could begin with Monty Python and say, and now for something completely different, because much of what you have heard so far will be different than the 25 minutes that I've got to speak to you. What I'll be talking about is a sort of aerial view. I'm not an art historian, as um, most of you will know. I'm just a bog-standard historian who has dealt with the 19th and 20th century particularly. And I have been asked to look at the question of coming to terms with the past or critically examining the past. And I prefer this second term, not Vergangenheitsbewältigung, but Vergangenheits of Arbeitung. Obviously, I can just cover a bit of the ground. It would be preposterous to maintain that I could 
go through it all. You'd have to have a lecture that went an entire semester. So forgive me that I'm sort of taking a bird's eye view here, a bit flying over it all briefly. So what I want to talk about, I'll be doing in four steps. I'll just to remind you, I'll be talking to you about the ideological role of art in the Third Reich. And then I'll look a bit more at the legal and political examination of the past. Then I'll look at the sort of research-based academic way of engaging with the past, which is important because it covers some of the ground that we're looking at here today. It's perhaps the most important thing that we're looking at at this conference, and perhaps the most exemplary, exemplary role that we need to discuss here, because with all of the political statements that we've heard here at the end of the day, it's about research and knowledge and the making available of knowledge and information. And perhaps we need to ask the question as well in this context. And perhaps I'll say a little bit about that as well, as to why we have, we're celebrating 20 years of the Washington Principles. Why aren't we celebrating 70 years of the Washington Principles? There are historical and political reasons for this, and they play a role in the modern world as well. And our contemporary world, especially if we look at how we're going to deal with some of these challenges that have been formulated in such detail in practical terms in the years to come. And you can already get a sense, as I speak, of the conclusion I'm heading for, namely confiscated art, art stolen by the Nazi regime as a blank or in the shadow, which is why it's 20 years and not 70 years that we've been critically engaging with this. So just to touch on a few of these ideas, to begin with briefly, the ideological role of art in the Third Reich. Maybe all of you are familiar with this. I just want to recall what we already know here. So it's not about art for art's sake. It's about art as an instrument of an ideological status in which art, like so many other areas, plays a key ideological role. It is assigned this role. It's not paintings on for themselves. It's about paintings in a particular function. It's not about the fine arts in themselves, but in terms of their function in the Third Reich. And this is true for many others. You have heard that I've engaged quite intensely with Albert Speer. What you can find with him is that architecture is race ideology cast in stone. This is something many people haven't really considered, and historical architecture or architectural history has sort of balked at engaging with these issues here. It has to do with the fact that the way we have discussed the Nazi period has gone through certain waves. Ideology wasn't always at the focus and quite the, op quite the opposite is the case. It was pushed to one side. So art reflecting the race state, quote unquote, as seen by the Nazis. So paint on canvas, race ideology in this oil form. It's not about paintings in their own right. You need to bear this in mind to be able to discuss what happened until 1945. And this morning, you have heard the figures, how many tens of thousands of artworks were stolen, were sold, were destroyed in Europe. And you can only explain this for ideological reasons, not for purely pecuniary reasons or any others. Then the question of legally processing all of this and what's been termed entnazifizierung, denazification. You will all recognize this picture of the Nuremberg trials. There was one, there were 12 further ones, 1945, 1946. And if you read the protocols and all of the documents, which we have, what you'll find is that art and the whole question of art was almost not mentioned. There were questions about military warfare, war of annihilation, forced labor, and so on and so forth. So that means for the debate at the time and the awareness of our contemporaries from 1945 and 1946 and the years afterwards, the whole question of art was secondary. And if you look at the central collecting point pictures, it all looks very picturesque, but it's not at the focus of what was the basis of political decisions about how to deal with the Nazi past. So art, to a certain extent, 
was a sort of blank, and I'm exaggerating to make a point. And this continued into the 50s in Germany. You will know, if you followed the Gurlitt story, that he was able to access things which before 1945, he traded in art before 45, much in the way he did after 45. Hermann Luber talked about the communicative silence, communicatives beschweigen. So that meant that many people in German society in the 1950s were well aware of what happened before 1945. They knew what their neighbors did, but that one consciously did not talk about these things because one didn't want to make them the subject of a private or public social discourse. So actively being silent was a strategy to ensure that these things did not get brought into the public space because there was a sense whether it was just a feeling or whether it was calculated that that would be too much for the society post-war Germany or might destroy it or because many people still felt that this was part of a process with which they still identified with a bit, but unfortunately we had lost the war and therefore we couldn't admit it openly. So this was the sort of mindset of the 1950s in Germany and it's definitive for the way in which art was dealt with in the society too. Also a communicative, active act of being silent. There was a change that took place from a legal approach, if you like, a sort of add-on to the Nuremberg trials at the end of the 50s. This was legally processing the Nazi past, if you like, that started very slowly. There was the Einsatzgruppen trial setting up the court in Ludwigsburg, which will be celebrating its 60-year anniversary in a few weeks. This was something which took place 13 years after the end of the war, what began then really, and then gained ground and was significant in the early 60s, 63 to 65, that there were then the Auschwitz trials, Fritz Bauer is now someone many people know as a public person. If you look at the films about Fritz Bauer that have emerged and his contemporaries, then you will have a real sense, having watched these films, of the context and the difficulties, the difficult challenges in which Fritz Bauer carried out his activities. So this is the central beginning of a public debate here in Germany, 63 to 65, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung daily, reported nearly daily on the Auschwitz trial, which was new. Suddenly there were TV shows, there were radio shows that engaged with these issues, and suddenly the public debate began, which continued into the 70s, the Majdanek trial, which went from 1975 on. So that by way of an understanding of how this regime was dealt with by the courts in the 60s and 70s. And now a third aspect, the development of Holocaust studies as an academic subject which began in the 50s. So first of all, and I'm going to show you what I mean using a number of books, what you see here is that this research didn't necessarily come from Germany and didn't necessarily come from professional historians. So what Leon Polyakov and Josef Wolf did and what they produced here were amateur historical accesses, people who had experienced it themselves, like Yo Josef Wolf, who had survived the Holocaust themselves and made this their mandate in life, if you like. Not a scientific, not an academic historical approach, and it's not what we mean by Holocaust studies, but this concept hadn't even come up yet. You see this if you look at one of the very few books that really did look at the process of extermination by a Brit, Gerald Reitlinger, and it uses the title used by the Nazi perpetrators. The final solution, the end losung, was the term used between 1939 to 1945 to describe the process of dispossessing Jews, driving them out of Germany, and then annihilating them. 
This book was published in German, and you can see that the title chosen in Germany has an interpretation which was typical for the 50s. It's called The Attempt to Exterminate the Jews, and in Ger the German title is Hitler's Attempt to Exterminate the Jews. So Hitler is responsible. But it's quite clear that who's responsible. And this was the interpretation in Germany from the 1950s, which went into the beginning in the 80s, where research into the perpetrators began properly. So just to show that it's not limited to Germany and Europe, this lack of interest is a book which has been debated at length by Raoul Hilberg, 1961. It was his PhD called The Destruction of the European Jews. Now, Hilberg got, got $15,000, which was a lot of money at the time, and it still took him six years to find a publication. Even though it was sponsored, it was rejected by Columbia University Press, even though it received an award which would have obliged Columbia to print it. Yad Vashem rejected it because it was too critical of the significance and the role of the Jewish councils. And in 1961, this book was finally published against the zeitgeist of the time, and despite the zeitgeist of this time, which didn't want to talk about these subjects publicly in the way that we do today. And then finally, in 1961-62, the discussion of Eichmann in Jerusalem by Hannah Arendt, which also looked at the role of the perpetrators in the Nazi regime, triggering a debate in which questions that we deal with today did not play a role at all. Not Reitlinger, not Hannah Arendt, not Hilberg, none of them look at art and art confiscation by the Nazis. It's just about analyzing the regime, the perpetrators, the structures of National Socialism, and the whole question of how this society in Germany worked in terms of the perpetrators. And now I'm going to have to skip over this more quickly. Two examples of very few texts that were written in Germany in the 60s and 70s. Wolfgang Schäffler, who worked here in Berlin, a book which was published by the Civic Education Society, but it was a text that was meant to be used for teaching. Then, of course, you'll know this in 1978-79, the Holocaust TV series, a real turning part point, surprising for many in the academic world as well. Suddenly, this debate was discussed by millions. And within academia, until 77, 78, the whole question of Holocaust studies, if you look at the books which were published then that were there to give you an overview, were only touched on in a few si pages. And this triggered the public debate with this unexpected success of this issue because of this TV series. If you watched it, if you were alive then, you will know that Germany's public service broadcasters, the ARD and ZDF, were flooded with phone calls and letters by viewers, and the historians were on the defensive about why the things that were presented here in the TV show so clearly were not corroborated and communicated by historians thus far. And the response to this is quite straightforward because historians are only ever a mirror of the discuss discussions in their society. And so far, this was not a public debate in the way we are having it today and are used to having it today. It was simply not something that you talked about. And it was much the same for Claude Lanzmann's Shoah from 19. 85, a standalone film in a number of ways, not least because it's nine hours long, but also for something that you couldn't do today or wouldn't do today, namely its focus on oral history and on people who actually witnessed these events who are filmed and it quite clearly leads to re-traumatization of the people interviewed here. So as a historic document, it's incredibly valuable, but it's very painful to see the processes through which those who 
were involved in the film are taken. Then two quick jumps here that bring this in a form that we understand much better, namely the integrated histories that Saul Friedlander has published on the 80s about the Dritte Reich, the Third Reich and the Jews in German and in English. And this is then the first time that somebody has successfully managed in a convincing way to, as he described it, as we know it from research, to present something integrating the perspectives of all of those who were impacted on. This is a history that covers all of this ground. But it is indeed the case that this was a completely different understanding of what the Holocaust meant in Central Europe, that one no longer just looked from the perspective of the perpetrators, looking at the structures, but actually attempting to try to understand what this meant for social processes for millions of people. And the result of this, something that was just about being finished, and the first volumes of the translation into English are ready, that the concept of the persecution and murder of European Jews in the Nazi regime published by the Institute for Zeitgeschichte in 16 volumes with a number of different professors and researchers involved, which is aiming to do exactly what Friedlander set out to do, namely presenting a pan-European work that covers the entire area in Europe, reflecting the intensity of what took place, depicting the processes that took place then. What you find are letters from people directly affected, diaries, both by the perpetrators, but also plans from Auschwitz, diagrams from Auschwitz. And the whole thing gives you an overview that makes it possible, if you're interested, to, to see a number of different perspectives. And for the first time as well, to a certain extent, looking at the question of confiscation of cultural property by the Nazis. All of this, in a nutshell, reflects here the research institutions that have been there since 1953, there's Yad Vashem, which has changed its name now, and the initiative for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which was entered in 1993, very much defined by Raoul Hilberg, and at our institute since 2013, the Center for Holocaust Studies, which has the aim for the first time in Europe, this is really uh, the first time in Europe to have a designated Holocaust Studies research institution within the framework of a larger research institute, because for over 70 years we've been engaging with the history of, the na of National Socialism. And now I'm going to talk about stolen art as a blank, and you can see that between 19... 45 and 1949 or 1957, I have touched on these two aspects. And 1998 and 1999, there is a massive blank. And this blank has to do with the fact that in this period, the public debate and public interest in this subject was absolutely minimal, to put it mildly. And the result is that Mr. Lupfer touched on this in his talk earlier on. There were initiatives and there were consequences, but it is not the case that you could say that since 1998, art, history, research, and provenance research has flourished as a field, quite the opposite. And anyone who's been involved and has followed the public debate will confirm that it was really through the scandalization of the Schwabinger trove of artworks, the Gurlitt case, that that generated the public interest that we now have tried to, or have had for Holocaust studies generally through the Holocaust TV series. So the fact that we're sitting here today is a bit due to this, you know, 20, 30 years ago we didn't have that. And that is an absolute reflection of this very development that I've just sketched. So the result of this is firstly that we are learning 
that societies prioritize certain issues, and in this prioritization, both intrinsically from within the society and externally, there's an effect. So there was the legal critical processing of the past that the Allies basically forced on Germany from 1945 on, and then at the late 50s, the Germans themselves, if they were involved in the legal side of things, may have taken it further. So from this period, so 45, 46, and then 58, you see these stages of punishment, reconciliation that sort of thing. And then there's the historical and scientific critical examination of the past which pursues a particular interest. The Institute of Contemporary History has been engaging with this, and this impact on the public was something that took decades to build up and form. It's, again, a reflection of the sounding board of German society and its interest or lack of. And this was true for 98 as well. So, again, 98, this was an impulse from outside. It didn't necessarily come from intrinsically within the society. It was 1988, the Washington Conference brought it into the focus of our society. And then there is a sounding board there again, because the time to engage with these issues in German society has come. One wants to engage with it. This sense of urgency is finally there. So what does this all mean in its consequences? Well, it was 1998, and until recently, and I think the speeches that we heard this morning showed this once again, it was a, an, an endeavor very much driven by politics, and you could make comparisons to the way it was dealt with in the courts and historically as well again triggered by political initiatives. However, and that's what I want to argue here, the decisive social and real impulses only really arrive if there is a social debate and if there is academic research on these subjects. And this is why it is absolutely crucial that academic issues be decoupled from these political frameworks, or to put it in another way, that research institutions emerge just as legal institutions emerged after the Second World War, or generally research institutions on history are ones that must pursue the whole question of provenance, research, restitution, etc. Only then will there be a real communication with society about these issues if we succeed in ensuring that the academic contents are communicated through the images that were confiscated by the Nazis and all the other artworks that were confiscated by the Nazis are separated from general questions of photo ops and all the rest of it. And if academics have a decent funding level, just as Ms. Savoie described now, and that can only be the beginning if this areas are able to work on the basis of self-determination and not orienting on political requirements, if they can simply set their own agenda independently, Article 5 of the Constitution, freedom in teaching and research. If this is successful, if politicians are prepared to give academics enough funding to do this, then we will achieve far more and much faster and will achieve results much more quickly than if we simply wait for more political impulses to come from outside. And I will conclude on that note. Thank you very much indeed for this overview. And I think I'd provide a linkage to the previous presentation. It is always, to some extent, worrying one's own interests that opens up new perspectives. In the first case, Mitterrand Cole, it was the worry that uh, it could be very different contextual 
art problems mentioned and in Germany it was the collapse of both the GDR and the Soviet Union which uh, brought up the question of the restitution of socialist appropriated property and that helped uh, to bring the subject we're discussing, discussing today into the wider debate. Now we are widening the angle to include the international scale. We have panelists with us who are going to explain just what, since the Washington Principles, has happened in their countries. Because we don't know them all, I would say that I will introduce them and everyone who's just been introduced will come on the stage so that we know just who is who. That would be a nice way of doing it. I will start with Stefan Nurli. He is a lawyer working in art transactions, charitable organizations, non-profit, family-run businesses, international trade transactions. He was the extraordinary professor for art law at the Case Western Reserve University School of Law and represents museum foundations, trust collections when it comes to acquisition, purchase, and lending. He is a um, high caliber expert for legal matters pertaining to art. A variety of institutions have used his services. He's going to tell us what has happened in the United States since the Declaration of Washington Principles was passed and now. Jan Bank wrote himself that it was the day of the German invasion into the Netherlands, 10 May 1940, when he was born. After he studied history at Amsterdam University, he first worked as a journalist for a um, regional newspaper before he joined the historical faculty of the universities of Groningen and Utrecht. He was professor of history and media at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam and ended his academic career as a professor for Dutch history at Leiden University. From 2001 until 2017, he was a member of the Dutch Restitution Committee. His most recent publication, Churches and Religion in the Second World War, was um, published at Bloomsbury, London, two years ago. Mr. Blank, please join us on the stage. Tony Baumgartner is a partner in the Clyde & Co. law firm, an international law firm where he is in charge of pictorial arts. Um, his extended scope of activities also comprises trade law and international settlement procedures. His particular commitment is for social insurance, in particular trade risks and credits, terrorism, political violence, pictorial arts, as well as uh, surety matters. He's a member of the advisory panel of the British government, which comprises a number of experts, advisors, dealing with uh, claims for or uh, against Tony cultural Baumgartner objects disappeared during the Nazi period. Tony Baumgartner, please join us on the stage. Dr. Christoph Basil, senior civil servant, is head of the uh, conservation and uh, restitution of art section in the arts and culture department of the Austrian Federal um, Office in Vienna. He studied law at Vienna University and after that in 1994 he became a civil servant. In 1997 he did an internship with the European Commission in Brussels. In 2000 he worked as a uh, paralegal at the administrative law court and in 2005 he uh, assumed the job of the deputy head of the con conservation issue and in 2008 he became head of the restitution department. Since 2015 he is in charge of the um, department dealing with conservation and the restitution of art. Would you please join us too, sir? Professor James D. Bindenagel, 
Um, holds the Henry Kissinger Chair for International Relations and International Law at Bonn University, where he is also the director of the Center for International Security and Governance. He is a former ambassador and diplomat. He served in both the Federal Republic of Germany, the German Democratic Republic, and in the then United Germany. So to some extent, he himself embodies German history. From um, 1998 till 2002, he served as um, U.S. Ambassador to Germany and was the special um, Charlie d'Affaires for Holocaust-related questions. He was one of the co-organizers of the Washington Conference on Assets f uh, coming from the Holocaust era, and he negotiated the Washington principles with European governments, international museums, as well as private collectors. Dr. Michael Markus Franz is a lawyer who wrote a PhD thesis on civil law problems of the exchange of cultural goods. He is an expert for the German Ministry of the Interior and he is dealing with the internet database for cultural goods uh, moved during the war. He has been in charge of the Magdeburg Coordination Center as well. He's an expert for legal question to do with NS looted art and cultural objects and restitution, and as such, he is a well-known expert in um, institutions both in Germany and abroad. Since 2015, he's been in charge of um, a new administrative deck. He's also the head of the um, Magdeburg uh, uh, Center um, for um, German Lost Art, the German Lost Art Foundation. He's also teaching legal ethics. Professor Markus Franz, could you please join us here? Isabel de Master de Chamon, and I hope I got your name right. She is in charge of the um, manuscript department of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Uh, she has studied at the École Nationale de Chartres in Paris since 1998. She's done research on provenance and restitution issues. Together with Didier Schumann, she authored the official looted art report, which the Mission des Tues um, and the, uh, was, was co-published by uh, this organization. And in 20, uh, 2018, together with Shlomik Steinberg, she was a curator in one of the major exhibitions in Jerusalem, also at the um, Museum uh, of Judaistic Art in Paris. She's been one of the organizers for the Section Luchid Art of the Holocaust Era Assets Conference in Prague. She has uh, been responsible for numerous publications, including a book about a Berlin art dealer between Republic National Socialism and Exile, which she authored in cooperation with Padre Colinia and Christina kratz kresemeyer It was um, published in 2016 in Cologne. Isabel Masna-Chamon, please join us on the stage. And last but not least, Dr. Uwe Hartmann, a Director of Provenance Research at the German Lost Art Foundation in Magdeburg. From 1982 to 87, he studied history of arts at Berlin's Humboldt University. And from 2008 until 2014, he was in charge of the provenance research uh, desk at the Institute for Museum Research of the uh, Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. Before that, he worked um, for um, the um, Magdeburg uh, Lost Arts Office, and he was also uh, lecturing at the University in Berlin, at Humboldt University in Berlin, on history of arts. Apart from focusing on provenance research, he's doing very much in the field of history, history of arts, and the institutions of these disciplines in the 20th century, particularly in Germany. Dr. Hartmann, please join us. So, we have a largest round, and according to our schedule, we have one hour for the debate. 
So if one wants to be fair and equitable, as our principles demand, and give everybody an equal chance to speak, let me please ask you, each of you, speak from your own national perspective, but be concise and tell us what you each consider important post-Washington principles. We've heard the, the big sort of lines being talked about this morning. And for the sake of simplicity, let's start with, yeah, with you. Where else? Right next to me. Uh, and uh, please, please be brief. I'd say, everybody, five minutes. I don't want to repeat much of what has been said uh, already. Let me give you my very personal view as, as a historian, an art historian, and um, for art history as a discipline, the most important momentum has been to learn that behind the various objets d'art, especially paintings, there are stories, which uh, the hermeneutics, uh, iconography in, in art history, we haven't been aware of before. And that story is something which is becoming clear now in, in, in a lot of uh, very popular exhibitions. And it shows that this very specific context of one object, its history, and the history of the biographies of the owners, that is something which we are trying to find out. And it needed the Washington Impulse 20 years ago to go that route. Yes, I think that for French people, a key moment was the um, allocation of uh, our president, then Jacques Chirac, Jacques Chirac in 1995 who recognized the responsibility of France in the Holocaust. It has been the beginning of a, a huge work about our story and our memory. And this work was about France, in France, by French people. And I think that for us, the Washington Conference and the principles have been a very important moment to understand the um, power, the strength that we could find in international cooperation. And I think that a conference like today um, teaches the same lesson, the importance of international cooperation. Thank you very much indeed for these kind words of welcome. Um, Dr. Hartman and I have been dealing with uh, Nazi looted art um, for almost 20 years, and it may sound like a long time, but I must tell you, uh, speaking personally, it seems like very short. And Mr. Brechten's presentation made very clear to me just how, under dynamic uh, conditions, the requirements, the expectations, the political mandate has all changed. And given this, starting with the Coordination Center in 1994, where we, we were only four people to start with, and now 2014 we were seven, uh, from 2015 it became a, a bigger center. I mean, all of that made clear that we've reacted to these requirements and, and reacted very quickly. I'm not telling you any secrets if I say that a, a wonderful uh, institution like the center to get that off the ground and, and agreed and realized between you know local, regional, and federal government in Germany, it's definitely not something that happens every day. I don't want to bore you with figures, but I have brought a few that maybe are worth um, picking up on. And they delineate the development of the German institutions and their notification regarding lost art fines. What was the status 2002, 2008, 2018? Then we have a range of books which uh, one of my colleagues have realized, uh, Dr. Barisa Blunt, where you find a lot of examples of fair and equitable solutions. We've done a lot of consultancy work on, on individual cases, providing advice and support where necessary, so much by way of an introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to just uh, note that when we started this project uh, with Stuart Eisenstadt, who's here, I was pleased to join this, this project because the United States and Germany, as you saw today with the signing of the joint statement, have a common commitment to human dignity and, and justice. And that was driven uh, home to us as we tried to establish what we wanted to do and address this issue of Nazi confiscated art. We found that uh, the one of the most important things is to re remember what happened and to recognize uh, what had happened. And so as you heard just in the last, uh, last discussion, 
it's taken a very long time for this discussion to happen, and it is not yet one on its own. But I, I will say that I came to this with the invitation of Stuart Eisenstadt because of that common commitment for Gerechtigkeit for Wolf. Thank you very much. Also, thank you for inviting me. Um, so somebody mentioned the word of administrative beauty. Well, as an Austrian, of course, I'm happy that we have a, 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 a law, an act of parliament uh, determining restitution of art and culture, which has been around for 20 years. In the last 10, 15 years, we've been engaging uh, much more in provenance research. So uh, we are fortunate that we have uh, results now that we don't need to be afraid of the collection history that uh, somebody mentioned, that we, we can react to claims and above all, the history of our own museums is something which we're much better aware of and we understand these days how museums have acted during the National Socialist regime and how art theft was organized, at least in part in those days and I think that alone is, is a plus for our debate and for historical uh, research um, to, to just talk about uh, Nazi looted art because as far as I know the structures and the stories of collections it, it's valuable to do this research and to have a structured approach and to have it all underpinned by a law and by a commission and an advisory council and all of that. Thank you. Um, the United Kingdom has um, been a long-standing supporter of the restitution of stolen property um, with the Allies we signed the London Declaration back in 1943 and it recognized uh, as did the other Allies that stolen property included specifically included stolen art it took some time for us to get the drive uh, along to uh, in, into top gear and to set up the spoliation advisory panel which we did after um, the 1998 Washington conference uh, the panel was set up in 2001 uh, it comprises uh, a number of um, experts across different fields, lawyers, historians, moral theologians, philosophers, uh, art dealers, curators, uh, and so it reflects the spirit of the uh, Washington principles. Um, we have extremely wide terms of reference, much wider than many of our uh, sister panels. Uh, all that has to be done to engage the um, jurisdiction of the panel is to demonstrate that an object was lost by uh, a claimant or their uh, heirs um, during the Nazi era. And uh, that is extremely wide ranging. We don't have um, the difficulties that um, our European um, s brothers and sisters do in um, having the, the volume of artwork to deal with uh, through claims. And, and perhaps that's why the panel has really only dealt with uh, a handful of claims. I think there's been some 21 reports, depending on the number of claims that you look at, with 13 recommendations for return, um, some for ex gratia repayments, uh, and uh, legislation that has been passed to allow deaccessioning from public institutions. We've had uh, a review of the panel's work conducted a couple of years ago and uh, a revisit and reformation of our terms of reference and a renewal of the panel, which I think shows the United Kingdom's commitment uh, to um, supporting and encouraging this very important work. <coughs> I'd, I'd just like to say something about the Dutch uh, Restitutions Committee. Is, uh, the, this committee was established in uh, 2001. First, some numbers. Uh, 176 claims have been received up to now from 2002 up to October 2018. 74 claims were granted, 19 claims partly granted, partly rejected, and 63 claims were rejected, uh, partly from Jewish uh, claims or, and also from other than Jewish claims. Our decision-making process in 2002, this object, mainly paintings, of the so-called NK collection, it was mentioned uh, already in the, in the morning, looted art by the Nazis and brought back in 1945. And of the so-called uh, Reichskollektion, this is a German word, this is a Reichskollektion in the, in the Netherlands, state collection. It's not only 
uh, looted art brought back, but also uh, paintings, mostly paintings or works of art in state possession. In 2008, we introduced the so-called binding opinion for works of art outside the dimensions of the state. In fact, paintings of provincial musea, we also have not only in Germany, but also we have a federal structure in this kind, or city museums or even private institutions could be subject pro to such a procedure. Uh, with regard to the critics this morning, I would say two things. There are two principles to be respected in our committee, and not only there, but also by the government. The first principle is looted art should be given back to Jewish owners, or, as in many cases, their uh, families, but third persons could be considered not uh, being able to receive the art, because that's also a, a problem. The second point is, this uh, process of research and decision uh, should be uh, guided by fair and just decision making. And the principle of a fair and just decision making is excluding a sort of automatic answer to the case. It means that uh, fair and just decision making is our main uh, task as, as it is to give back uh, uh, works of art but the two could not be separated. Thank you. I think the American experience, while it bears some similarities perhaps to the United Kingdom because uh, America was never a repository for looted art, nevertheless is different than most of the other panelists um, because, um, I didn't know it was that funny, because <laughs> Most of the museums in the United States are private institutions, uh, not publicly owned. And so uh, this has been a matter of those institutions approaching this problem. And it bears a direct relationship to the Washington principles because, as I think Ambassador Eisenstadt mentioned this morning, um, the Association of Art Museum Directors developed guidelines about six months before the Washington principles, which formed in large measure the basis for the Washington principles. And since that time, um, American museums have researched their collections and placed them online in what I think Ambassador Eisenstadt mentioned was the portal, which unfortunately is out of date and needs to be revamped and revised, but nevertheless acts as a, as a methodology and a place where claimants can um, find works of art and then go directly to the particular museum, which usually has more information than that that appears on the portal. There have been a, just slightly below 60 um, uh, artworks that have been restituted or claims have been settled. Um, there has been litigation um, and that has been controversial. And recently there was a specific statute creating a federal statute of limitations which was passed by Congress. It establishes a six year statute and a 10 year period. Um, there hasn't been a big spike that, uh, that we've noticed in claims since that statute, but we're only two years into the 10 year period. And so we'll have to wait and see whether it has a really demonstrable um, effect. And so um, the work continues, um, the research continues, and um, the um, number of works of art that can be identified as having been in Europe between 1933 and 1945 um, should hopefully continue to be brought to light. So we have two very different ways of approaching this issue. On the one hand, we have the US and the UK, where we're dealing with immigrants whose property um, is something which the heirs or themselves uh, can claim. They, they can claim there's losses. But then we're also dealing with two other countries, the Netherlands and France, both occupied by Germany at the time. And I'd like to know from both uh, of you representatives, what is the way you deal, how, how do you deal with this problem that initiated by the occupation in those countries, art was confiscated, was so, uh, stolen, but there were also local institutions, local collectors that collaborated with the occupation. 
How do you process all of that? What is the reappraisal of this? It's, it's less a problem for the US or the UK. It's very much a problem, though, for the, the, the Dutch and the French. Yes, in France, um, the, the main um, department who um, operates the spoliation was the uh, Commissariat aux Affaires Juives, so the Jewish Affairs Department. And of course, all the research we do are made uh, for looting operated by German uh, authorities, but also by French authorities and we we have also uh, a commission uh, in charge of reparation and this commission works for all the all the all kind of uh, of looting i will just add as we spoke about the spoliation advisory panel and the restitution committee that the commission for l'indemnisation des victimes de spoliation the commission for reparation in france um which was created in 1999, of course, uh, has been conceived, helped by the spirit of the Washington Principle. Uh, this commission has to examine individual claims. It's not a jurisdiction, the thought it's independent and composed in part of judges. Its approach is, in practice, much more pragmatic than legalistic. And so I think it's important to, to underline that the spirit of the Washington principle is well present in this uh, commission. Perhaps I, I give you the... It's working? It's, wor it's, it's working? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, first of all, if I have understood well your, your question, um, in this, uh, say, 50 years after the war, the collaborators are all dead. The collaborators are all dead. Um, for example, there was a, a case where... Uh, ...was doing some uh, dirty job in uh, stealing, um, in this case, uh, from a Polish owner um, uh, paintings. But Menten is dead, so that's not uh, uh, that's not anymore our business. Or, uh, to, uh, uh, to say something, um, uh, in general, we we have a we, we have a judge at, on on, uh, on paintings and not on persons. I think uh, it may be. A, I hope it is an answer to your to your question. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, and no. Of course, you're quite right that. Now, yeah. it tends to be just the descendants who are still alive, even the grandchildren of the descendants, as it were, of the heirs. But in terms of dealing with all of this in the area of art and culture, there are complicated connections between the occupying forces of Germany, the Wehrmacht, and local art collectors or art dealers. So my question is, is that a particular problem, a particular difficulty in sort of working out what was what? Well, maybe I could give you a different response. One of our big issues is the, what's the German word, the art from 1933 to 1940, we had good relations with Germany. But then there was this refugee tax or something like that, and German citizens who wanted to emigrate from Germany had to pay this sort of flight tax, as it were, for fleeing Germany and sell their artworks. And this is a big part of our work is trying to f track these artworks that were sold in the Netherlands and are maybe even in the Rijksmuseum, our national museum. These are very important parts of the collection of the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands. And maybe 1933 or 1935, they were basically 
bought by force from Jews who wanted to emigrate. And this is part of our job, basically. If I may, I'd like to just add uh, what, what really drives just and fair solutions. And this, these are the issues that uh, have led us to have the United States have various ways of trying to deal with those issues. What's the definition of looted art? Is it 1933 to 45? Is it genocide associated with? Can you own it? All of these issues have become very important, and, and also from the history, where who stole it and what. So in the United States, we have had several ways of addressing this. One of them that is really the best way, in my view, to find Gerechtigkeit, justice, is to have the party sit down and agree on what it is. They actually have a case that worked this with the North Carolina Museum, where the the, uh, it, the heirs and the museum were able to sit down without lawyers and, mm -hmm. and talk about what happened and to come to an agreement and the painting remained in the North Carolina Museum with the payment. That was a very good way. There, was a, there are, of course, other ways. There are judicial claims that come immediately into question, what is just and fair? Mm -hmm. And then once you have a judicial claim, then you have a whole range of legal issues. And we know with the Austrian question about putting a bond forward before you can go to court, and statute of limitations, all of these issues become then a second uh, kind of negotiating style. The Seattle Art Museum was, a, was an example that I had, I dealt with where it had a painting in, that was, grant, that was sold in the United States, granted to the museum, and the museum had a fiduciary responsibility, and so therefore had to bring in lawyers. And, and what is just and fair? This is, again, the, the definition of just and fair. We had another, uh, the Art Institute in Chicago had a, claim with the Degas paintings, uh, landscape with smokestacks. Then you had a judicial claim, and then you had uh, <coughs> negotiations, and then you had eventually a settlement agreement. So another, another way of finding out or defining what is just and fair. And then finally, the most complicated ones, there are two of them, one is the Gautzbicker case and the other is the Klimt case, where you had a whole series of, of events trying to define what is just and fair. So conciliation, international facilitator, judicial claim, negotiation, settlement, or arbitration, and eventually an arbitrarial award. This is the debate that makes it very hard to define what is just and fair. Now there's another counter example, and, and we heard about it this morning when two auction houses in New York were mentioned. What Christie's has done is actually taken that first step of the North Carolina Museum, set up guidelines, advertise it, and so when they have an opportunity for a sale, the first question, of course, is to whether or not that provenance is, is clear or not. Becomes then what Stu Eisenstein said, the most important thing in determining just and fair is the provenance research. Provenance research can bring the two parties together, then you can either sell it or not sell it, you can keep it or not keep it, you can own it or not own it, but then you have a competing model. That would be the model that I would say we'd want to pursue to define what is just and fair, to try to bring the parties together and not end up with all the legal issues that go with trying to resolve these things through legal questions. Well, that means on a pragmatic level that it would be really, really important to institutionalize provenance research because for it's decisive for these cases. I think you... Yes, if I could just add something to what we've just heard by Mr. Bindenagel, this whole question for a just and fair solution. You know, it seems as if the whole debate gets reduced to restitution or not restitution, but fair and just solutions opens a whole prism of solutions or spectrum of solutions. And you can see it in our articles of association or our statute of finding fair and just solutions in our institute. And on the expert level, on the fact-based level, provenance research is indeed the foundation. And if you go past the legal issues or don't get success with the legal issues, then you can go on to the moral level. And sometimes we see that this leap from the legal to the moral is sometimes a bit difficult because as soon as you are aspiring to fair and just solutions, you can't always be oriented on standards and laws which makes you very flexible, though, on the other hand. At the moment, we're occurring, coming up with a guideline where we look at the question of fair and just solutions, where there's one chapter devoted on that, where we set out all of the things that we can derive from recent cases in the last few years to offer guidance, but also to make it clear that the range 
is enormous. I, I do think it's critical in order to um, arrive at a just and fair solution um, is to have the facts. And that's where provenance research, which is, which is not easy uh, often, but is so critical to having an understanding of the parties um, completely with respect to what happened. And that can really help in order to inform people and, um, and arrive at something that is just and fair. But without those facts, without that provenance research, uh, it's extremely difficult uh, to, to come to a just and fair solution. By the In the preparation for this discussion here, one thing that went through my mind was that the most clever decision in Washington, well, it wasn't really a decision, there just wasn't any other option to say that it not be set out by law, that we not seek a legal formulation. Because if you look at the problems that we're encountering today in the European Union, I'm thinking of the whole refugee issue, it, this would be one of the findings that we should take away from the Washington principles, that one should make agreements that don't have a legal basis. How do you see that? I can also speak on behalf of the negotiations and say that this was an issue. There was uncertainty. And then MoMA had an Egon Schiele, and Glenn Laurie then called lots of people together. And the Association of Art Museum directors came out of this conference with, and the Congress basically said, we're going to do some guidelines. And from that, I talked with Stu Eisenstadt, who, who then said, yes, we could use that basis for these discussions, and then went to Europe. The last thing the Europeans wanted to hear from the Americans was, here, you take our, our guidelines and you follow them. Obviously, I understand that. Uh, so the idea was then, what is it that we can agree on? And it was uh, this four-month discussion uh, with uh, for instance, in the, in the case of the Netherlands, Frank Mayor put together an interagency group, interministerial group of everybody that could be involved, and then you could really have a negotiation, and that was when the Europeans said, principles, okay, although there was this question about if 11 principles, that's kind of Marxist, and I said, well, we could do 10 principles and have the 10 <laughs> commandments, and that's the kind of attitude that we had in the discussion, and it was important to have principles that people could then lead. So at the end of the last round of negotiations, when the Europeans again objected to even the principles, Stuart Eisenstein said we sat down in a small uh, group of about 10 Europeans and us, and Eisenstein suggested that these are principles. These are not law. Law has to be made on a national basis, and we put in what he called the chapeau, the little beginning, that implement these principles according to your own law, on your own terms, and that's where we are 20 years later. Sorry, I would say the provenience forschung is in, in, in fact a child of the Washington principles, and of the it's, it's a younger uh, science now. You, you saw them uh, in all the the, the, yeah. the pictures. And uh, I think in, in it's, it was never in such a on such a scale this this provenience forschung as it is today, and it is in an important condition for our decision making process. Dr. Basel. Well, I think we have to distinguish here between, you know, it's not whether the Washington principles are soft law or guidelines, they're not legally binding, but morally and politically they are a clear target that we're all pursuing. But in the individual countries there may be differences. It depends, of course, very much on the organization there, the way the museums, the public administration is set up. In Austria we have a national law, which is a helpful solution for us because this just and fair solution phrase comes in there. I know it comes from the sort of English-speaking world legally and has a tradition, which makes sense. But certainly in, in Austria, it has triggered all manner of discussions, what is just and what is fair. So for us, either we give it give back or we don't. If it's Nazi looted, then we give it back. 
because whether it's just and fair, I don't know, but it would be certainly unjust and unfair to keep it if it's looted by the Nazis. So there's some that we give back, and there's some that we don't give back based on provenance research. But you need to have clear provenance research and a clear academic basis to make a decision that is hopefully just and fair. I'm afraid the heckles off mic we cannot hear in the soundproof booth. So now I'd like to ask everyone to respond to the following question. Where in the years since the Washington principles in your own work, where would you see the biggest deficits? Or perhaps you don't have any deficits, and that would also be good to hear. Well, I think they're very clear. 20 years after Washington, and nearly 75 years since the end of the Second World War, from the German perspective, we are still not able to assess the dimension of the confiscation of art and cultural assets. We still can't break it all down by number. And I think it's by all of the achievements that we've made, we have assumed two things. One, quite rightly, as we've heard, from the perspective of the victims who had their works stolen from them, the bureaucracy of the post-war period, they had to prove what they had lost. They had to make assert their claims. And now I have to repeat myself and say that after Washington, the institutions in Germany have been forced to check their own collections. But I like, for example, the Ratkeller lessee you know, medium-sized company, perhaps, or further down. This man, between 38 and 54, bought over 100 paintings. And of course, the American authorities noticed this, but he got nearly everything back through the central collecting point because he was a Munich art, a, a, a famous Munich art dealer said this was old, all old Aryan ownership. You know, and these are all these areas that have not been covered by the re research because the claimants haven't been able to access them on the one hand, but also because they didn't end up in public state collections where almost no research has been carried out and so we cannot present any results. Is it still possible, is it at all possible to get results for collections of this kind? Well, one job that's huge that we still haven't done, even though for our research infrastructure it's immensely important, we have nearly all auction catalogs available online, thanks to Getty and the Art Library in Berlin and Heidelberg. And essentially, every individual artwork can be picked out if it is described as not delivered for, or delivered from non-Aryan ownership. And there are many pieces that we do not find there so that we can say, right, this was stolen by the Nazis, but nobody's actually looked for it yet. No errors, etc. Okay. So which principle, for which principles there is a lot of things to do still? I think that the principles for some of them were a vision of the future. And I take, for example, the principle six about the constitution of a central registry. Uh, of course, it was a, a, um, a wonderful idea 20 years ago, but very difficult to do. And we know, as we, we say, we, we hear this morning, that now with uh, digital technology, we are closer and closer to, to the possibility to do that. So I think that there are a lot of things to do, but really uh, all we can do with uh, digitization and databases will be a next step, a very important next step. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to add on to what Dr. Hartmann said and what you just said as well, namely the question of the database. Now at the beginning, I promised you a couple of numbers. I'll focus on three. In terms of lost art, you will find various different categories of cultural assets. There's looted art. You find 
see searching and finding. You find legal and natural people within Germany and abroad. Let me just give you the 2002, 2008, and 18, the figures in which the German public institutions had findings, had pieces, and it was 770 objects that they found six years later. 6,000, well, over 6,000, and today, in 2018, over 43,000 individual objects where there is a gap in the provenance that suggests they might be suspicious. Now, Ambassador Eisenstadt described that very well by saying that we're well on the way, but we need to take the last step in this path. And I would agree that based on this last art statistics alone show you how this processes of recent years have developed. Last art, let me just add, as I just said, doesn't just cover reports from within Germany, but also from abroad, outside of Germany. So for example, you will find the Israel Museum in Jerusalem looking for things. And I'm pleased that there are colleagues from Jerusalem who are here. Maybe we could come back now to what Dr. Basel was saying. Professor Lufa referred to this in his remarks earlier on today, namely the decision of the German Administrative Court from 2015. Which at the time, it was the claimant of lost art saying, how should one deal with this from a legal point of view? And the German Administrative Court, in quite an interesting ruling, decided that lost art is just the documentation. It's not a means to an end. It serves the finding of fair and just solutions. So what happened here? The court really made a connection between the level of facts and the moral and ethical level about this database, which is a very important signal for our work on the lost art database. I would also say that perhaps the most important thing that we've experienced recently is what Monica Grutter said 2013 after Gurlitt, something really happened. A lot happened. But the next thing that I see that we still need to do, though, is that Germany has a sort of backlog, you know, the 16 federal states who have sovereignty over art, and this backlog can be broken through. I think the federal government had a trove of art that they received from the Americans in the 50s, which they still have. They are now in the fiduciary of the financial ministry headed by Ms. Grütters. One idea could be that the national government in Germany, because in historical terms it was the federal states, or rather it was the country, it was Nazi Germany, that confiscated this art in the first place, and therefore one could say that the federal level of government here in Germany could decide that they're responsible for this, and then there wouldn't be a problem with the 16 federal states. That would be one option. There, one could have provenance research then be carried out. There are some 600 paintings, 500 drawings, and other artworks as well. One could carry out provenance research on this. And then one could look in museums, and one could share these histories of the provenance research. One could exhibit them. One could show what is being done and tell this story as an example for the federal states, for the museums, and for the galleries and museums so that the public can understand what's going on. So this isn't really my proposal. The French have already done it. The MNR collection was collected, put together 20 years ago with an inventory, and there was an exhibition in Israel, and now there is a gallery on it looking at the provenance history of the artworks, and it's an extremely important contribution, something that motivates me. And then around justice, we can see that they are saying we remember. It's not, you know, the question of what belongs to whom. This is all the matter of history, and it's sort of a warning 
as well for the future. And then the federal states can say, okay, that is one way of dealing with it. We can cope with that. But, so your question was the deficits, if I've understood you. What deficits are still remaining? It's a difficult one because I do think we're doing a fair bit. I think everybody here is doing what they can. But in terms of the crimes and the level of art that was stolen, the sort of scale, I mean, it's very hard to do justice to it because there's just such a lot. But let me come back to your question. I do think that in Austria, we don't just have provenance research and artworks. We've also got other measures that we've put in place as well. The, you know, encountering, meeting victims and their heirs in the context of art. We're doing a, a lot in that area. Also in connection with the Minister of Education, we're trying to do this on a number of different levels to somehow engage with this injustice. But it's it, it was injustice on such a scale that it's a bit difficult. Well, look, let me turn it around and try to answer your question more positively. I do think that we've managed to put a structure in place through the commission to carry out historical research that we have a foundation here. And in terms of what we're doing on the national level, you know, we've involved the federal states as well, but we've set standards and then also the standards that we've applied to art trade, the auctions, you know, whether we should say their names or not is another matter. They are mostly on board. I was saying before whether it's, I don't know if we're doing it in a way that is just and fair, but not to do it would be unjust and unfair. So that's the way we're looking at it. We don't want to make the same mistakes again or do things wrong again in the way that we could, even if there are individual cases that we could obviously discuss and may have different opinions on, as I can sort of get a sense of from the heckles in the audience. It's perhaps somewhat controversial. The, the scale of the looting that went on um, b between 1933 and 1945 was on a supranational level. And I think sometimes these sorts of problems require supranational solutions. So I, I would say perhaps what we really need uh, is an international response, a, a coordinated and combined international response. It can't be right that simply through the luck of where your things ended up, you face claims based on the same moral claim. Uh, you face pursuing claims in different jurisdictions simply because of the lottery that you um, um, that resulted in your works being confiscated and then s spread across the world. Um, that can't be right. It's not fair on claimants to have to go to, uh, with um, uh, to different jurisdictions and, and having to face different rules. So I think having a one-stop shop would be a great solution for claimants. I know we have to deal with reality. And, and that, that will require a, a, um, some hard political negotiations and some hard political dialogue. But um, if, that's, if we're looking for solutions, I think that's really the only one that will um, answer all the problems that we have. Otherwise, I would echo every, what everyone has said here about the issue with provenance, that um, we are making steps uh, in, um, uh, in, in putting money at the problem and, and uh, establishing the gaps in provenance putting stuff online, uh, that is a huge step forward. Um, to the extent that we can't get international cooperation, let's at least have it on the European level. And I'd like to see the European Commission doing much more than it is now uh, at the moment. I know that they're doing a lot and we can't do everything at once, but it is something that needs to be addressed very quickly, I think. Uh, I would say the greatest disadvantage is the loot of art nobody is asking for because the rights to claimants are dead, and that is still a, a, a main problem. The greatest advantage is, as, as my colleague said, the, the birth of the provenience as a science. Uh, I think it's not only for the present problem of looted art, by uh, Jewish uh, looted art, but also for the next chapter, the colonial art. It will be very useful that there is a provenience tradition already. Young people, and that will be very flowering, I think. I think before thinking of what may be deficient or still lacking, it, it, it doesn't hurt to 
to focus for a moment about what's been accomplished. And in 1998, Philippe de Montebello said that the art market would never be the same again, and he was right. Um, and the Washington principles have accomplished that. Um, and I don't think we should lose sight of that. But if the goal is to restitute works of art that were looted, then um, what the, the first and foremost is one has to find the works and bring them into the light of day and bring their history into the light of day. And that's not easy. Even though there are 30,000 works of art um, on the portal in the United States, um, that doesn't mean that the complete provenance of those works has been identified and is available, nor does it mean that every work has been found. And um, even though there have been great advances in technology, the fact remains is, is that provenance research itself, even though access to records and archives, is still a time-intensive project. And it takes really knowledgeable people who know what they're doing, and there are not a lot of them. And there have been efforts made to educate people, both in the United States and, and abroad. And, and that, Tony, is an area where I think there has been really good international cooperation with international symposiums and events like this that bring people together in order to be able to be educated in ways that can be helpful. But to bring this, these artworks out into the light of day and to let people find them and then potentially make claims, th that's the thing that, while it's not lacking, can't stop. I'd like to use this opportunity of having so many experts up here, art historians, legal experts, political historians, to just share one last thought in this panel, and that is how we can sort of transfer this knowledge and get it out there, just as you, you just referred to, with art in collections that maybe didn't get into these collections in what we might say was a clean way. For example, the colonial collections. What do you think? This new awareness, which is doubtlessly generated not least by the Washington principles, this is much more broad-based, this awareness now, and that you can't just naively go and buy art. This, if nothing else, surely the Washington principles have managed to achieve in many networks in any case, and that's a great deal. But what do you think? What sort of impact could this perhaps have on other areas of collections in museums from your professional perspective? And of course, you know, we don't want to have everyone answer here, but if somebody wants to answer and has something they want to say, I'd be interested in hearing that. I would like to say that uh, the talk from Robin Quinville that we heard this morning is the point of the Washington Principles. The Washington Principles is about art, of course, but it's really about life. And it's about how we treat life and how we're treated and how we look at each other. And, and the concept of justice is what we're talking here, but it's also, if you talk about colonial art, who does it belong to? Very difficult to know. But what does it say? What does it say about us as, as those who have collected it, or those who have stolen it, or those who have uh, wanted back? Does it say something about us as our civilization? Does it say something about other civilizations? I think from the Washington principles, we wanted to say that it isn't about the objects themselves. It's the relationship of the objects to justice, to what happened to the people, and to remember that. And so I would say that if I were hoping that there was a crossover, a transition to other issues, it is what is art and how does it, what does it mean for us and how do we treat it? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, thi I think that um, as far as colonial uh, Raubkunst is uh, at stake, uh, it's more a question of states, I think, and for musea, and less, as in the case of Jewish property, of, of private persons. And that, will, that means that, uh, that there will be another system of uh, restitution of, of, of colonial uh, works of art, more, more state to state. As I, I don't know exactly, but President Macron has uh, promised to give back to Benin the, the works of art, or is it to private persons in Benin? I think it's still about it. It, these are 
government, governments, I think, not so much private ones. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid the mics have all been snagged down that end. All right, one doesn't want to compare different things, of course, but one of the main functions, I think, of engaging with the crimes committed by the Nazi regime is to look into the future, to think, what can we do better in the future? Because, you know, we need to look to the past to make sure we know what to do in the future. And I think with discussions about provenance research, about art, we achieve higher standards. You know, maybe this is another layer on our society that we've achieved here to hopefully improve things. And we see this with the discussion of President Macron. And I think there are discussions in lots of countries now about colonialism, colonial cultural assets. Is this a sort of, we could also look at looting of art within Europe as well. And I think as a whole, we have achieved yet another layer of shellac, if you like, on civilization through this discussion. If we're lucky, we'll achieve another layer. Let me add on to that. We have changed the international standards for public collections and museums, and these standards were contributed to significantly by the Washington principles. But there's something else I'd like to say here, and it's just about every individual having an awareness of their responsibility, certainly from a German perspective or even a European perspective, to look at our rights as consumers. I'm thinking of Benedict Savoie's comments that she made here. I think we can demand, or I need to be told if I buy bread or if I buy fruit and vegetables, it has to be what it says it is on the tin. It has to say where it comes from. And I have to say that as long as there are art collectors, people who are interested in works who do not ask where the art they're interested in comes from, or are happy to live with the gaps of knowledge about the provenance, provenance about this product, and I'm just saying it that way, and I know there are many passionate art collectors who wouldn't want to hear that it's a product, and I know they've got all sorts of reasons why they want to buy art, but this appeal is still there until you have all of the information with no gaps in the provenance, you need to be aware and say, I'd rather not. I can only agree with you, of course, and I'm very pleased that at least here at our international panel, we certainly can agree on some of these basic things. I want to thank you very much for this round. I think we've had a look beyond Germany as well, that we have connected digitally. And I'm pleased as well that the principle of the Washington principles, the spirit, seems to be something that is spreading around museums and art. Thank you.